All right, well, before we jump right back into boot camp, I have some reports and updates from our missions team. So the LA trip, I, I know you all have heard some testimonies and Isaiah talked a little bit about it last week, but it really was an amazing trip. The, the team did so awesome. They worked really hard and I think they learned a lot. We learned a lot through it as well. And I think it's something that we're going to be doing yearly. So join us next year. We already have dates picked. The information for that will be coming out soon. But I'm happy to report that it was financially, the LA trip was financially completely covered, thanks to your generous donations. Um, so thank you so much for that. We can now move on to Tanzania, which is the real beast of this summer, um, just because it's, it's a bigger trip in terms of time. It's a bigger trip in terms of finances. It's a bigger trip in terms of spiritual growth and development. It's just bigger all around. It's also way more travel and all of that. So all of that said, if each of the Tanzania team member, members raises their original goal of $3,000, then we expect another $15,000 to come in. But we still need another $14,000 on top of that to cover the whole amount. So that's about $29,000, which they leave in 33 days, y'all. To me, that's terrifying. But we serve a big God who is totally capable. I, as I keep praying about this, stressing about this maybe is a more appropriate term, but I'm, as I pray, I, I keep hearing God remind me of the story with the coin in the fish's mouth. Do you know that story? I actually want to read it to you because of how often God keeps reminding me of this story. I think it's something for all of us to stretch our faith a little bit. So let me read this to you. Matthew 17, verse 24. On their arrival in Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and asked him, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, Peter replied. Then he went into the house. But before he had a chance to speak, Jesus asked him, what do you think, Peter? Do kings tax their own people or the people they have conquered? The, they tax the people they have conquered, Peter replied. Well then, Jesus said, the citizens are free. However, we don't want to offend them, so go down to the lake and throw in a line. Open the mouth of the first fish you catch, and you will find a large silver coin. Take it and pay the tax for both of us. So much going on here that I don't have time to get into today. I would love to preach this passage sometime, but this wasn't a government tax. It was a temple tax, one for Jewish males over the age of 20, and it was about two days' wages. So it wasn't a small thing. Like, we think of a coin as like a quarter, a small small amount, pay it and move on. But it was actually much larger than that. Um, but the point here is I keep asking God to send us that fish, right? The, something weird and unexpected where we can find money that was hidden away just for us. <laughs> it's just a fish swimming around out there somewhere, just waiting for us, waiting to be used. You know, it's going to be used for the best purpose on planet Earth, right? To spread the gospel, to see lives changed with the message of the gospel. And not just in Tanzania, but in our people, those 14 people from Freedom Valley who are traveling there, they come back so changed and on fire and passionate. I mean, you guys remember last year when they did the service? For us, they're going to do that again this year, but it was, it's so powerful. You come back so inspired and ready. There's no better place to put your money than to invest in eternity, right? But I also know that we are scraping the bottom of what the church can do. You all have given so much already toward missions this year. And so we're looking for that fish's mouth situation. That being said, we're planning another raffle in the month of July, and I actually think God gave us this as a tool, as one of those fish's mouth situations, but the interesting thing about that story to me is that uh, it doesn't require no work, right? Peter still had to go out and fish. He still had to put in the skills and the work required to get that coin. It's not like it was just lying around. And so sometimes those things still take work. He still had to work for it. He had to go and use his skills. But it's, it's a meat raffle we're actually doing in July. I just want to mention this because you'll get more details next week. 
um, but be thinking about it a while. Uh, Sam Yaquez works for the Farmstead Butcher, and we're going to buy this big package of local meat. Um, there will be lots of winners for this one, not just one winner who will receive a package of beef. So I think it's something that we'll be able to sell really easily in our communities. And I'm asking all of you to participate in this. I would love if every single one of you took a packet of 20 tickets to go and sell in your community because we're not limited on tickets, first of all. But second of all, this isn't just a missions team thing. I keep saying this this year, but we're all sending the team. It's a team coming from Freedom Valley, not just a team of 14 people that are going. Does that make sense? We're sending them into all the world. And so I hope that more of you will join us in this. Um, again, it runs the whole month of July, so I will have tickets and more information available for you next week. I'm going to be handing out tickets in the lobby, begging you all to take them and sell them. Um, you know, yeah, Siri, she's not still here, is she? She was here in the last service. She went door to door with the last raffle we did, the Yeti one in May. She went door to door in her neighborhood and sold them. And it was one of her neighbors that actually won. But it was also a chance for her to talk with them about church and Jesus and what we're doing. And so Sam's going to share his heart on that a little bit more next week as well. But I hope that you'll do that with us and uh, be a part of this mission to Tanzania. Will, will you? Will you do that with me? Can I actually hear a yes, absolutely, we're with you. You got to talk back to me in this particular message because I have some homework for you a little bit later. You better get used to talking today, okay? Okay, okay. Let's get to boot camp. So far in this series, <clears throat> we have covered some tangible military tactics. Remember, this is boot camp, okay? It's not just being passionate and being inspired. I hope that this, this series has inspired you. I really do. I hope that you have left feeling ready, not ready, but willing to share the gospel, convicted and inspired to share the gospel. However, we haven't gone over very tangible tools yet, that is the phase we're getting into now, okay? So Tim Edwards sent me this um, list of, I just lost it in my notes, this list of uh, military boot camp things that they cover. And I just thought it was so interesting because I want to remind you of what boot camp actually is. Let's see the list here quick. In actual military boot camp, they teach marching. They teach military knowledge. They teach discipline, physical fitness, weapons training, survival skills, teamwork, healthy eating, other skills like rappel and hand grenades and small team navigation, small team land navigation, things like that. So I started looking over this list and I was like, you know what? We've covered some of these things already for sure. Like I see us as having covered marching a bit. We're learning how to walk in step with each other. That first week, we talked about how to be born again, how Jesus really pushed being born again because the, the religious leaders of the time were not walking in step with him. They were out of step. They were off mission. Jesus was pulling them back in, learning, trying to teach Nicodemus how to walk together with him. So we covered that the first week. The second week, Aaron Holt, evangelist Aaron Holt, taught us how to share our story, how to use our military knowledge, and what the actual mission is. And then last week, didn't Pastor Isaiah cover discipline so well? I mean, <laughs> I hope a lot of us were convicted a little bit about what we spend our time on. He just led us so well in that. Some There are some things that, we pour time into, and they're not necessarily bad things, things we love and enjoy and entertain ourselves with, but we probably have more time than we think we do, right? If we just disciplined ourselves, sharing the gospel is the most important thing that we can do. The most, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A productive thing that we can do this side of eternity. And so, yeah. Before we get into today's teaching, I want to remind you what the church is and what it is not. This is part of that. The church is not just a religious 
routine. It's not just a religious exercise. It's not a, a place of judgment or hierarchy as, as the world so often thinks it is. In fact, it's not a place at all. The church is a gathering of people. The first words used for the church were more of a socio-political connotation than religious. It, it was a group that was focused on something, a mission, um, an inspiration for change, and people working together to create something. It's why early governments were so afraid of it, actually, because it was people banded together on a mission for change. When people work together toward a goal, they are powerful, aren't they? And so I think actually what, what might be a better term for it to understand in our today's vernacular and language is committee rather than church, right? A committee is a group of people who just get together for the purpose of accomplishing a goal, right? That is closer to what church meant in the mouth of Jesus in his time and context. And so the church is it's a group of people on a mission toward the future. So the church is also not something of the past, but biblically, it is the future, okay? It's how the future will be governed and organized. Jesus and his church are the future. So I hear Christians say a lot, something to the effect of, I love God and I love Jesus. His teachings are cool and all, but I just don't know about the church. His people are just poor examples of who he is. Don't get me wrong. I've had thoughts like that too, right? Church hurt is real and it sucks and people hurt each other and power can go to anyone's head, right? It's not always a healthy place, but when the church is healthy, oh, it's so good, why not fight for health instead of abstaining altogether? Because if you plan to move forward into eternity with Jesus, there is no other option. The church is how it's going to be governed. Jesus was the first person in the Bible in history, really, to use the word church, not temple, not tabernacle, not synagogue. Jewish people would have been very familiar with those terms. He invented a new term for the thing he was creating. It was actually ecclesia is the Greek word for it. And it's, again, this gathering of people on a mission. So it's not a place. It's a gathering of people with one mind, one mission. We're not just camping out and waiting for Jesus to come back. We're meant to be busy, productive purposeful. We have got work to do. Let me illustrate this today with Acts 1. Just biblically, I want to prove this to you, okay? I say these things a lot, but I want you to actually hear it from the, the lips of Jesus. So Acts 1 verse 6. Now, just to put this in context, the beginning of Acts happens um, in the timeline of events. It's after Jesus's ministry, after he died and resurrected and was with the disciples on and off for 40 days, they're up on this mountain, right? The Mount of Transfiguration. They're up on this mountain, and this is what happens, Acts 1, verse 6. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Has the time finally come? They keep asking him and asking him this. Can you see how they just don't quite understand what's happening yet? We know with hindsight that Jesus is about to go back to heaven. Like... <laughs> What are you guys talking about, right? They still have no real context for what they're meant to be doing. They think Jesus is still going to fix it all right now in their time and place and culture and context. Not that I blame them because this is all bonkers. <laughs> like none of this has ever happened before. They're in new territory. But anyway, he replies to this question. They keep incessantly asking him. The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. Anybody else need reminded occasionally that not all of God's plans are meant for me to know? I don't like it particularly because I like to know the plan. I would very much like to know the plan. Like, give me all the D. Give me A, B, C, and D. I will follow them, God. Just I need to know the plan, the time, and the date so I can be prepared. The funny thing is, God doesn't tell us all of his plans. I think, and I've 
wrestled with this with God a lot. Like, God, why wouldn't you tell me the plan? Why can't I know the plan? God, his response to me one time was that I would skip ahead if I knew the plan. (laughs) And he needs me in this time and place to learn the lessons that I need to learn today so that I am ready. Because he can prepare me way better than I can. Anybody else? Somebody else needed that word today, I think, because it took a long time for me to know. Anyway, they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Last thing Jesus said to his disciples on planet earth. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. So why are you still standing on the mountain? (laughs) I think they were like, guys, we wouldn't have been sent if you could just, if you would just listen. You're too busy standing, staring, waiting for Jesus to come back. He gave you a job to do. Go on. Get out of the nest. Get off the mountain. Go do it. So the question isn't, when are you coming back to fix everything, Jesus? But more, how can I help accomplish your plans today? Right? Jesus redirected the disciples when they asked, when? And he put them back on mission. Be my witnesses is the mission. So... A witness is called upon to tell the truth about what they, it's actually a legal term, right? A witness in a court of law is called upon to tell the truth about what they have seen and heard and experienced firsthand. It's not an expert witness, just a witness. We often think we have to be expert witnesses. We have to know everything about everything. What if somebody asks me a question I don't know the answer to? What if I make God look like a fool because of me? God can take care of himself He can also give you answers in the moment, which he has done for me many times. But you're not called to be an expert witness, just a witness. Go tell the world. Amen? Are you with me so far? Okay. At this point, I know you're probably like, okay, Candace, we've been talking about this for weeks. We get it. We know. Hopefully, anyway. Hopefully you are already inspired to be a witness in your world. But I know that people walk out of of sermons like this inspired, but still ignorant. Meaning, we don't know what to do with all that inspiration. We may be passionate, we may be convicted to go and share the gospel, but we don't actually have tools to, like we don't actually know how. So we, Jesus told us we need more workers in the harvest field, right? The harvest is plentiful, it's plentiful but the workers are few. And honestly, as I was, I was thinking about this sermon this week as I was outside in my garden, gardening is hard without the right tools. Collecting the harvest is hard. I, every time I go out to collect a harvest, I always forget like a basket or like a bucket or something, and I'm always kicking myself. Every time I go out to weed, I'm pulling weeds, and I'm like, where is my hoe? Where is my... Right, like I'm always looking for my tools. It's harder without tools, right? And so I I think that there are so many tools out there to collect the harvest. And there is a plentiful harvest out there. We just don't have workers with the right tools in the harvest field. So I want to put you out into the harvest field with this series, but with the right tools for the job. And that's actually my job as a pastor. Did you know that? A lot of people have a misconception but pastors should be the ones doing all of, all of the work, preaching all of the gospel. We can, if we can, you know, invite people to church, but let, let the pastors actually save them. I don't know enough. Right? Let them do the preaching. I'm actually not called to do all the work myself, but to equip the body to do the work of the ministry. That's my job, biblically. It's my job, Aaron's job, Isaiah's job, to give you the tools to do the work Some churches have actually stopped calling Sunday services services. They call them gatherings, right? Because it's more close to what this should be. Instead of 
pastors serving the congregation, the, this us and them mentality. It's we're a kingdom of priests. We gather together to encourage each other, to serve each other, but then to be sent back out and to serve the world. Does that make sense? I've never quite made that switch because it sounds a little bit cultish to my ears to call it gatherings. I think it, it communicates to the world what we do is more of services. But you get the idea, right? This series is meant to help us with this. It's meant to be an equipping. That's boot camp. We are equipping because what good is an army without training? What good is a farmer without tools? In the same way, a disciple is what good are they without training and tools? Does that make sense? So I don't want to leave you there. I don't want to leave you just feeling convicted, but not also equipped. So the rest of today, that, that was the preaching portion of today, meant to inspire you, encourage you, okay? The teaching portion is what's coming next. I'm going to teach. You will, today you will learn an actual skill in sharing the gospel and then we're actually going to practice this. Uh-oh. I forgot my marker. Mike, is there a blue marker on that table back there? Thank you. I need that. I, last, time, last service, I forgot my microphone. It's too many things. All right. So have you all heard of the three circles? Thank you, sir. Ever heard of the three circles? All right. This is a tool for sharing the gospel that I'm going to teach you today. And then you are actually going to practice. Like we're in elementary school. You're going to find a partner. And you're going to practice this together. Okay? That's what I told you. You're going to do some talking today. Are you ready? All right. Three circles. The first circle represents a world that is broken. Suffering. Death. War. Disease. Sickness. Rape. All of the, the things that are broken that are bad in this world. This is selfishness in humankind, okay? God didn't create the world to be like that. We brought the world into being like this through our own sin and selfishness. God created, I can't do a heart upside down. God created the world <clears throat> full of love, joy, peace. Unity, people serving each other, selflessness, right? This is God's design, but this is where we actually are. And sin is the bridge to from here to there. All of our selfishness, anything from lying to murder, keeps us in a perpetual state of being broken, okay? It separates us from God's intended perfect design, and so people will try anything to get out of brokenness. We'll try uh, drugs, alcohol, relationships, <coughs> even chasing a career or money. But all of these efforts, they just slingshot us back into brokenness. It doesn't actually fix the problem. We just stay broken, okay? But then there's the third circle, God didn't actually want to leave us in that place, brokenness. And so he sent his son, Jesus, who was God. He had no sin. He was offered as a sacrifice to die and be resurrected. And in doing so, he took on all of our brokenness, all of our sin. That's why I keep forgetting to show the whole class. He took on all of our sin and he restored us to God's perfect plan, making us new creations in Christ. You have to forgive my stick figure. I am not my daughter. I have no artistic skill whatsoever. Okay? <clears throat> we are now new creations in Christ when we can give our lives to Jesus. He restores us back into that perfect plan. And he teaches us how to live in selflessness, serving each other living in unity. And the awesome news about Jesus is he is the way out. He is actually the only way out. All we have to do is ask him for forgiveness and he restores us. We follow his example. You don't have to clean up before you come to Jesus. He is the cleanup. Does that make sense? That's the three circles. Jesus canceled our sin. All we have to do is turn 
and believe in Jesus, and he restores us back into this one. Do you see yourself in this circle or in this circle right now? Before we go any further, that is the three circles. Before we go any further, I want you to listen to this one more time. I have a video for you. I want you to notice that everyone from kids to old people, all races, all kinds of people can know this system, can teach it to others, right? And can see people come to know Jesus through it. Let's watch this video. Has anyone showed you the three circles before? Have you heard of three circles before? Has anyone ever shared the three circles with you? Before. No. No. So this is the first circle. So this represents the world that's broken. All of us live in a broken world. You only have to turn on the news and see... Suffering, death. War, sickness. Rape, disease, it's everywhere, right? But you know, God didn't actually create the world to be like this, full of brokenness, eh? Here's the second circle. This circle represents God's perfect design. God's perfect design was a world without brokenness. A world full of love. Full of joy and peace yeah. and unity. But what we did was we sinned. Sin could be anything from lying Mind to murder. murder. Wait, so like, just like normal lying or like hard lying? And what sin did, it separated us from God's perfect design and threw us into brokenness. And so people try all kinds of different things to get out of brokenness. They might try drugs or alcohol. Or maybe chasing a career or money. Smoking. Even bullying other people at school. Oh, sleeping suicide. around. Suicide, exactly, a good example. But it doesn't actually fix the problem of brokenness. It's like a bungee cord. We just get snapped straight back into brokenness. And ultimately, if people die in that state of brokenness and separate from God, and that means that that's eternal separation from God. Do you know what this place is often called? Yes. So what God did was, he didn't want to leave us in that place. God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. Jesus was God, so yeah. he had no sin. And when he died and rose again, he actually took on all of our sin and cancelled it like he crushed it. He said if we would turn away from our sin and believe in Jesus and make Jesus and the Lord of our life, we become restored, restored back into God's original design and you become a new creation, a new person in Christ. And will restore us back into relationship with him. So there's only two kinds of people in this world, people that are in brokenness or God's perfect design. Where would you see yourself? Probably right there, to be honest. Would you see I'm not sure. Cloud? Brokenness? Or the bungee stage. <laughs> yeah, the same. And where would, where would you, you like, like to So where be? would you like to be? You'd like to be here? Yeah. Right here. Give me your love. That's so good. One of God. So here. So is there anything that's stopping you? From turning and, and believing in Jesus. And allow him to be Lord and King of your life. Stubbornness. Probably not. Probably we, to be honest. Nothing mm -hmm. stopping me. You know the awesome news about Jesus? He is the only way out. If you try to clean yourself up before coming to Jesus, it's like trying to get clean before you take a shower. Oh, I see, yeah, I get that. Is there anything stopping you? No. We shared the three circles with 34 people. Four were already believers. 13 chose to remain in brokenness, but some were deeply impacted. And 17 wanted to leave brokenness and receive Christ. There are many powerful ways to share the gospel, and the three circles is a great place to start. Isn't that a great tool? So cool. I loved how they showed in that video. It got me a little choked up this time, but when people identified themselves as in brokenness, right, the desperation that we all feel, that we need a savior. It's my prayer that we actually have a heart for those people. But the world is living in brokenness, trying desperately to get out, and we have the answer. We should be sharing it with people. But I also loved how they showed the progress that was made at the end. Right? Even with all those red dots, those are still seeds planted. Sometimes we're not called to be the one that harvests, but just the one that plants the seed or waters 
a seed. But anyway, I want to actually practice this with you, okay? I want you to actually do it. I actually have ushers that are going to come around, and they're going to give you a piece of scratch paper. Don't worry about what's on the back. These are old cards we had sitting around for something. You're going to have a little piece of scratch paper. There is a sticker with the three circles graphic on it. This is for, you know, later for you can put it on. I put it on the back of my phone because the first time I saw this, I actually noticed it on someone's phone and I said, what is that? It's my hope that I'll have people that notice it on my phone too. And there it is right there. I don't need a piece of paper or a whiteboard. I can explain the three circles right here. So there's a sticker there. You can set that aside for now, but you need the pen and the piece of paper. Because what we're going to do is you're going to find a partner or two or three. It doesn't really matter. But you have to be speaking things out loud. Don't sit there alone and do this. Okay? Find somebody else. And you're going to do the three circles together. Like I said, it takes practice. Even this time when I did it. Anybody notice what I forgot on my board? The crown. Yeah. Forgot to put the crown on. <laughs> right? Making him the Lord of our life. So it takes practice just to get this all down. Uh, that's what we're going to do. We're actually going to put five minutes on my timer. And we're going to practice this together. Will you guys do this? I asked Aaron this week, do you think if I like make them <laughs> sit like a, a elementary school class and actually do this, that they'll do it? He said, yeah, I think they will. So, okay, five minutes is going to be on the clock. I will check in with you in five minutes. Find a partner now. Go ahead and move if you need to. Find somebody who's sitting alone. Find a partner. We're going to practice. Also, if you do need help, the, the circles are on the screen. I think you can figure it out. But if you need, like, a script, you need to actually step-by-step step go through this. It's in the sermon notes fe.church slash sermon notes or on the app, click sermon notes. You can do this step by step. Okay, five minutes on the clock. Go ahead and practice.
30 seconds. What do you think? You want two more minutes? You need two more minutes? Okay. Twenty seconds, wrap it up. You can do it. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. How'd you do? Yeah? Is this doable? Is it an easy way to share the gospel? I think so. Listen, though, this is only the first step. It takes practice. Now, honestly, I was just saying this to Telly, but it takes practice to make the gospel simple because it is so layered and complex and truth, like the truth is layered. There are so many good, amazing details in there that you want to be able to add in when you share the gospel, but to make it simple is actually a skill. There are people that are super, super good at it, right, and can lead thousands of people to Jesus all at once, but to make it simple, it takes practice, so I, I do hope that you'll go home and practice this again out loud just all by yourself if you want to, but practice it because it, it does take work to make simple. Now, this isn't quite the end. If you have somebody that says, yes, I, I want to receive Jesus, right? Then what? What do you do from there? So I, 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 we are going to go more in depth into this, but I, I, just in case you happen to have the opportunity to share this with someone this week, I don't want to leave you here. Say you've just shared the three circles, and then you present your person with an opportunity, right? You say, where do you see yourself here or here, they say in brokenness, what's holding you back from giving your life to Jesus today, right? There are a couple of options that they could say. You saw on the screen that there were 
different colors, right, at the end of that video? There were some people who said, absolutely not, that's not for me. Some people that said yes. If they say yes, we call them green. It's like a, a green light, go. <laughs> so they're green. And you, you would say, great, can we pray together, right? You should know, as a believer, if you are already a believer in this room, you should already know the sinner's prayer. This is what we call praying the prayer of salvation. And it is just, Jesus, I believe in you, right? You confess this with your mouth. Romans 10, 9 says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. So it's Jesus, I believe in you. Thank you for dying on the cross for me and for forgiving me, right? I realize that I am a sinner and I need your forgiveness. Please be the Lord of my life. Any version of that is what you're getting them to do. So it's praying a prayer of salvation. Jesus, I believe in you. Thank you for forgiving me. Help me live for you. That is their decision to follow Jesus. I would also carry some FE Church invitations in your back pocket, right? Come to church with me. Learn more about this with me. You're bringing them along. What we're also going to do over the next couple of weeks is learn how to start a disciple-making group. So you're studying the word with other people who want to be disciples and disciple makers. We're going to go over that next week or the week after, okay? That's green. Yes, I want Jesus. I want to pray the prayer of salvation right now. You may also, though, get a, a yellow person, which is, I don't know yet. I'm not quite sure. It's, there's something holding me back. I'm open to it, but I, I, don't, I don't know. I just don't know, right? They're not quite ready. That's what we call yellow. And then we would say, you know, are, are you at least open to learning more about Jesus? We could meet for coffee and I could answer questions or, or you could come to church with me and maybe get some questions answered there. Or, you know, you're, you're trying to help them get their issues with the gospel resolved to some degree. Then there are still people after that who say, no, no, thank you. I don't want it. I don't want any of it. Right. You saw all the red dots on there. Do we just drop them, walk away, screw you then kind of thing? No. We thank them for listening. Thank you so much for listening to this whole thing. I appreciate your time. Right? If you ever have any questions, we're here for you. Please, you know, give them a, a Freedom Alley invitation or something like that. We'd love to help if you're ever open. Maybe even say, could I just, would you be open to me praying for you before you go today? That kind of thing. But you're blessing them on the way out. And then you pray later, God, open their heart, soften their heart towards you. you. Don't just drop them. Does that make sense? There is a fourth option. You saw on the screen the, like, no color ones in their system. They, in this system, they call it the blue ones. But these are people who are already believers. You might come across some already believers when you're sharing the three circles. And that's great. You share your story with them. You know, ask them their story. Do you think it's important to share your faith? How do you do it, right? You make a, a friend. Other believers are the fastest friends to make because you already have so much in common and you can encourage each other along the way. Does that make sense? Red, yellow, green, and blue. Now from this, again, as we go through the rest of boot camp, we're going to learn how to create these discipleship groups. But I wanted to start with this today because it is such an easy way to present the gospel. And our world is hungry for it right now. The darker the world gets, the brighter our light shines. We have nothing to fear from the darkness. We bring the light with us. So there are people out there living in brokenness don't even realize that we have the answer. They're so thirsty and we have living water already prepared for them. Jesus has already died on the cross 2,000 years ago and fixed that thirsty, hunger, broken problem. All we have to do is present it to them. So this is what we're presenting. This is what we're going to be teaching our youth to do. I mentioned this before, but collision, this, this training that Aaron, Isaiah, and I have been going through, is primarily for the youth. We're going to be teaching them how to create discipleship groups in their schools. But I don't think we should let it just be a youth thing. I think it needs to be an all of us thing. 
I think we all need to be involved in not just being disciples, but being disciple makers. And this is a real discipleship making, disciple making model. It's not complicated. It's so simple. In fact, you don't have to be a theologian. No one asks you to be that. Okay. You just have to be willing to share the basics of the gospel. Because remember, if you haven't led anyone to Christ personally lately, you're not following Jesus in the way that he actually intended. I'm just going to let that sink in a little. Convicting to me every time I hear it. If you are not personally leading anyone to Christ, you're not following Jesus in the way that he intended. Just going to church and being a good person is not It's not what he had in mind when he made disciples. That was already happening with Jewish culture. He came to make it so much more than that. We are meant to be sharing the gospel. I think most American Christians would describe being a Christian as just going to church and being a good person. It's not it. Being a follower of Jesus Christ is a discipline of laying down your life for people, laying aside your fears and wants and desires and putting other people's spiritual needs first. It is spreading the gospel and living a life of sacrifice and worship of our God. So if you're ready to do that today, I hope that you are also a little bit more equipped to do that after today. Next week, we're going to talk about those groups, what they look like. We're going to go a little bit further into this this system. And I'm going to ask you, who is actually ready to start one? I think the Holy Spirit's already going ahead of me in this. And I think a lot of you actually are. But I, I want you to pray about it this week. Maybe fast about it this week. Our Tanzania team is fasting this week anyway. Let's all fast together for souls, for lost and broken souls in our world. Let's ask for God to give us a heart for people who are lost. And I I think if we're going to ask the youth group to do this, but we're not willing to do it ourselves, what are we even doing here as the church? Okay, this week, I, I will, again, next week, that is, I want to know who is actually willing to do this. But this week, I'm asking you to just go home and practice, to pray get ready. Will you do that with me? Will you do that with me? I heard like two people. Okay. Good. Let's pray. Father, today I just ask you for actual passion within us, a burning desire to see our world come to know you. God, I pray that we would be people who know the gospel inside and out, but we also know how to make it simple for people to understand and grasp. We know how to lead our neighbors, our friends, our family to Jesus, and we're not afraid to do it. God, help us be bold for you, on fire and passionate, vibrant, passionate, selfless disciples, just like you've called us to be. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did on that cross 2,000 years ago. Thank you that you laid down your life for me. Help me live with the reality of that sacrifice ever present in my mind. Help me truly remember the gospel everywhere I go, everything that I do. Let me live with that reality so that I can share it with others, so that I remember your love for others, and that I'm a light in my world. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Heads bowed and eyes still closed. First, today, I'd like to offer an opportunity. Just, I just want to know who's with me, really. If you're willing to go home and practice this, to take it seriously, to, to pursue being a disciple maker, would you just raise your hand so I know who I'm praying for today? Awesome, that's so many of you. Thank you. You can put those down. Secondly, today, I don't want to leave this moment without 
offering an opportunity for anybody in the room who might not yet know Jesus. That praying that prayer is important because like I said, Romans 10, 9 says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. And so it's this simple prayer. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. Thank you for your forgiveness. I know I am a sinner. I know I've messed up. But you forgave me. Help me live for you. Help me return to God's perfect plan. Living in selflessness. Help me make Jesus the Lord of my life. It's a simple prayer. But is there anybody in this room who wants to pray that today? Living for Jesus is not always easy, but this prayer is. This part of it, just talking to Jesus and calling on his name, is so easy. He came to make it easy. But today I want to offer you that opportunity. And if you're sitting in this room, all you have to do is raise your hand. And say, that's it. I'm, that's me. I'm in. I want Jesus and everything that he has for me. Anybody like that here today? Just raise your hand up high. Okay. One in the back there. Keep that hand raised so the usher can slip a little card in your hand. If you're watching online, you can text the number on the screen. I'd love to have that conversation with you as well. For all of our benefit, I want you to repeat this prayer after me today. Because you should be saying it all the time. We should all know this prayer, the sinner's prayer. It's honestly something we should pray probably every day. Remind ourselves of the gospel to submit ourselves to Jesus Christ. But it's also something you should know and be able to pray with somebody else, to lead somebody else in the sinner's prayer. So would you repeat this after me today? Jesus. Come on, all of you. Jesus. I know I am a sinner. I know I've messed up. But I also know that you came to forgive me. I believe you died on the cross. Thank you for your forgiveness. Help me live for you. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. God, once again, I ask you for passion. You have given us an identity as a church to be a vibrant, passionate, selfless church who wants to change the world with the message of the gospel. Nothing short of the gospel will make that a reality. Nothing short of the gospel actually changes the world. You change us, God, from the inside out. You bring us peace and hope for the future and love like nothing we've ever felt. God, help us communicate that love to the world. Help us be lights in the world. Truly do this. Live this out in everyday life. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.